Good morning. Uh, if you are logged on, glad that you're here. Sorry we're a little bit late. Um, people may be filtering on for the next couple minutes. We had a, what felt to me, a strikingly large number of people who were uh, logged on last week. Uh, we had like 18, I think, individual people who were on, which meant like those are all families predominantly. That's pretty close yeah. to like our normal yeah. Sunday morning for us, which is great. Yeah. Uh, hoping that we get more even this week. Hoping that you were able to find the link to the recorded one if you weren't able to see last week's. Um, this morning, I'm really glad that we get to continue to do this. And it's nice that we can have uh, you in your home so that you're safe uh, and us broadcasting from here. It's not quite the same when you're in your home, right? Uh, there's something about being in this physical sanctuary space that does sort of set intention and sets apart the time that we gather together. And presumably, you being home, you don't necessarily have that natural occurrence of being put into a, a separate space as a sanctuary like this. So what I'd like for you to do, we're going to sing a couple songs during the next few minutes. I don't know what makes sense for you. If you want to stand, or if sitting works for you, or if you want to kneel, if you maybe want to light a candle, if you want to open up your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to do whatever it is that you feel like you need to do in order to make this space set apart for what you need. Let's set this space apart for what we all need to be in worship together this morning. Thank you. 
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. But only lean on Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's arms through the storm. He is Lord, Lord. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all and He shall come with trumpet sound oh may in him be found trust in his righteousness alone all else to stand before the throne Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the You are the Almighty God who knows our future and our fears. We pray that we reflect your glory during this time through shared faith and pers perseverance. Hold our hearts and our minds and our souls captive in your unending love and remind us of who you are. Guide us, find us where we are, and lead us into truth. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You'll uh, 
take some time of reflection or prayer uh, with one another and uh, listen to the music and just have a moment. scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell those stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Good morning again. I'm sure that there's plenty about this whole process that uh, continues to be distracting. I'm sure there's something with our production of it, or there's something in your home right now that's distracting you from being able to participate in a way that you maybe normally would. Um, that's okay. Uh, I invite the interruption, I invite the distraction 
as long as we can all, I think, give each other grace, and as long as we can all come back to being centered on the word and why we're even doing this. So distractions are fine. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, though, that despite those, that we're able to uh, still hunker down and be focused on why we're here, which is uh, the word and being together. Thanks, Camille, for reading that part from Matthew. Um, so I'm going to read this scripture, and then I'm going to preach a sermon, and then that's going to be over. And then after that, I have like another thing to say. So I'm just telling you this now, so that when we get to where I say amen, there's a little bit more after this. We're not going to close our laptops at that point yet. There's still just a little bit more, okay? Uh, our second scripture reading is intentionally from the Old Testament. Uh, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of God. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase, and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these forty years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you what man does not live, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Know then, in your heart, that, a parent, that as a parent disciplines their child, so too the Lord your God disciplines you. This is the word of the Lord. Um, I'm going to level with you. I have never in my life preached a sermon series before, but we're in the middle of one right now. Last week, uh, we talked about the issues prevalent in the early church in Corinth and Paul's encouragement of them to be unified. This week we're continuing in the series of looking at God's people's responses to isolation. This week we see Jesus has gone away from his disciples, away from society, and is isolated in the wilderness for 40 days. At one point in those 40 days, not totally clear how long it lasts, he has this encounter with the devil, and it appears he gets the best of that exchange. But really, the majority of the time, he spends apart, he spends alone, isolated, wandering. The text that Camille read for us supports what I'm actually going to focus on just as much this morning, which is this passage from Deuteronomy, the story of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Now, elsewhere in the Old Testament, it tells us they did this for 40 years. And there are actually, beyond that number 40, some striking similarities between their wandering and that of Jesus. The language around not relying on bread. Did you pick up on that? It's almost exactly the same between the two texts, which might support that Jesus may actually be quoting this passage from Deuteronomy. Uh, in both cases, life appears for them to be nomadic. They're moving around a lot. They're not establishing home base anywhere. And in both of these stories, it's the wandering that is the point. They are not, in other words, wandering to anywhere. They are simply wandering for wandering's sake. And for both of them, this period of wandering happens right in the middle of two 
significant events. For Jesus, his time in the wilderness happens just after he is baptized and right before he really launches into his worldly ministry. For the Israelites, the story is a bit longer. The short of it is their period of wandering comes just before they enter the Promised Land, but it's happening right after an incident in which they didn't follow through on what God asked of them. That's a sermon for a different day uh, for this morning. We're just going to leave it at that and know that the Israelites were wandering. And it says God, in that time of wandering, was leading them, testing them, humbling them, providing for them, teaching them. And that is important because it's technically possible that God could have just left them alone for 40 years, right? They could have just watched Netflix and played cornhole that whole time. It didn't have to be guided. It didn't have to be God-inspired. As a matter of fact, if this was meant to be a disciplinary time that Deuteronomy says it is, a pretty popular form of discipline is time out, right? You go be by yourself. I'm not, I don't want anything to do with you. But God is there. That's not the point of their wandering. Both Jesus and the Israelites have intention and purpose for their time of wandering. Because remember, they are not wandering to anywhere. The wandering is the point. This period of separation from society, this time of seclusion in the wilderness, is not simply a void or a time to do nothing. This time had some identity-shifting implications. For Jesus, he had some wrestling to do. He had some temptation to overcome. And for the Israelites, this is a time of listening to God and trying to follow this new law-abiding way of life just before entering into the land God promised them when there is a time of wandering, you know with both these stories there's also a set intention, a time of wandering or decentralization or distancing oneself from familiar community. When you have that set intention, this can be a seminal time of change. So I'm a big NBA fan, I'm a big Clippers fan in particular, but maybe even bigger than that, I'm a, I'm a fan of basketball. I'm just a fan of the game. It has been two weeks now, more than two weeks, since I've been able to watch basketball. And I know there are many of you who are grieving with me for not being able to watch the NCAA tournament right now, especially given the fact that it was looking like Gonzaga had a really strong chance to win the whole thing this year. That's been a real lament of mine. I have, uh, I'll just let you know, lodged an official complaint with God this season saying, hey, I gave up beer for Lent, not basketball. This was not part of the agreement. The lack of sports in my life has left what feels like a sort of void. The precautions that we're taking around uh, being safe around the virus have emptied our lives of much more than just sports and have emptied them of things that we did not agree to in this Lenten season. It is kind of amazing, though, that this is all happening at this time. Set aside the fact that this is happening in this day and age in which this is possible. If this happened even 20 years ago, this probably wouldn't be able to work. I don't know what we would have done. But not just the day and age, but this specific calendar year season, the fact that this is happening during the Christian church time of Lent, 
is remarkable because there are so many of these natural consequence uh, overlaps that this pandemic is affecting us, that uh, overlap of what we would be doing in Lent anyway. Think about it. Lent is supposed to be a time during which we reflect on what we really need by following Jesus' lead and giving up certain things to help us focus more closely on what is centrally important. My country just told me that I cannot go watch basketball at the brewery down the street from my house. I have been observing Lent for the majority of my adult life, and I have never given up anything so extreme as that. All of us, whether we have elected to because of the season we're in, or whether we've been forced to because of what's happening in the world right now, we are all giving something up right now. And so we wander. We wander with Jesus during this season of Lent. And we are doing it with uh, an unparalleled connectedness to his journey. I'm not sure that this has happened in our culture before. We are reflecting on that which we really need in our lives amidst physical removal from one another the way Jesus did. That's the purpose for this season of Lent. You know the nice thing about seasons, though, is they are done on purpose. They are predictable. They follow a calendar. You know when they start and when they end. Jesus elected to participate in this time of wandering, and we can elect to join him. That is not, however, the circumstance of the Israelites. And that is not the circumstance the world finds itself in right now as we respond to this pandemic. In both cases, this has been forced upon us. This was not on our calendars. God's people we see in Deuteronomy, are wandering because something has gone wrong. God wanted for them to be enjoying the promised land long before this part of the story. And though it is great that we can participate through this live stream together in worship, we are all having to meet virtually because something is wrong. Something did not go according to plan. This week we were encouraged by our governor to stay home for anything other than quote-unquote essential business, which technically, I think, went into effect at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday evening. That same day, at 3 o'clock, just before this mandate to end all non-essential business, I was privileged to participate in the funeral of Freddie Ernest. At about 10 p.m. on March 5th, after being in his mother's womb for only 27 weeks, Freddie was delivered in the hospital stillborn. His service wasn't supposed to be for another few weeks. But on Tuesday, the cemetery called Freddie's parents and said, because of what the governor had just decreed, that the service would either need to be canceled or moved up to the next day. No one was ready for Freddie to pass away. And no one was ready to say goodbye. That funeral was the third moment that this virus has had a benchmark 
impact on me. The first was just a couple weeks ago when many of us gathered in this sanctuary for my ordination service, and instead of what would be have customarily been, uh, well, would have been customary for that day of laying on hands, uh, people instead extended arms in my direction. The second benchmark moment was just this last Sunday, in which we all met virtually, and I and Camille and Dave did this from an empty sanctuary. And the third was standing on that cemetery lawn, just ten of us, about six feet apart from one another. It was in that moment that I felt acutely aware of this one thing. This is not how things are supposed to be. This child was not supposed to go when he did. That funeral was not supposed to happen. We are not supposed to live our lives separated from one another. And so things are not the way they are supposed to be. Not with the Israelites, not during Jesus' time, certainly, not with us. Which begs the question, has there ever been a time when things have gone according to plan? When have things ever been the way they are supposed to be? It seems our five-year plans are doomed to fail as life perpetually lobs its unpredictable grenades into the middle of our illusions of control. Knox Presbyterian Church, you do not yet know me as well as you someday will, and so I'm going to let you in on a little thing right now. Anytime I'm asking these big questions from up here, you know I'm about to read us some scripture. It says in Deuteronomy 8, we live not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. How are we supposed to live with everything going awry all the time? Do we live on toilet paper alone? We live by the word of God. The tense here in the text suggests both in Deuteronomy and Matthew, this is happening in real time. We don't live on every word that came from the mouth of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? The active, present, real-time tense suggests that which sustains us comes from something that is happening right now because the mouth of God is not closed. Amen? The mouth of God speaks, and those words are what fill us up. Think about this. Those words from Deuteronomy were written down hundreds of years before Jesus quoted them, and he says them as if they are alive and active for him in that very day, that very moment. Humanity will live on every word that comes from God. By doing this, Jesus is encouraging us not to think of Scripture as this closed-off, historical, finite thing, but instead to recognize that God speaks and is still speaking, and it is through those words that we have life. This mandate that has affected all of our lives to stay home other than essential business contains that phrase that has become very popular now, essential business. And I think the category, or to categorize essential business is sort of funny. There is actually a list of things that are deemed essential business, the very top of which uh, our healthcare providers. Our church administrator, Shanela, who so graciously wrote the prayer for us this morning, she works at Union Gospel Mission at Ann Ogden Hall. She's been at work 
this whole time because her work has been deemed essential business, caring for her residents. I work in homeless housing services at Catholic Charities. I was at work every day this last week because that work has been deemed essential business. Nurses, doctors, law enforcement, caregivers, essential business. And up until just a few days ago, before the governor amended the stay home, stay safe mandates, uh, we were going to have to broadcast from my basement because uh, doing this from a sanctuary was initially considered non-essential. And I just am wondering who among you are feeling like your livelihoods have been counted as non-essential. Freddie's funeral date was moved because it was considered to be non essential. The rhetorical question that has been echoing in my head since Monday night has been, who gets to judge what is essential? Church, you are essential and you provide essential business. Predominantly, spiritual care is essential business. It may not be recognized by some as such, and so there are adjustments to the delivery of that care that need to be made, but it is essential all the same. And it is the essential business of all of us to carry out. The very essence of being the church is essential business. I think of Don and Tom and our deacons and many, many others in our church providing spiritual care for people near and dear to this church. That's essential business. You may have received a phone call from Shanela this week or last uh, who, while physically distancing herself from people, is making sure uh, people's essential needs are being met and fielding those requests. That's essential business. Encouraging one another, caring for others' needs, just listening to others, this is essential business. And this can still be done while responsibly following the guidelines to promote healthy living. This is not just your rule-breaking pastor telling you to run out there amok to try to take care of people. Things are not happening the way they were supposed to. And without us caring for one another, this time is going to merely be this empty timeout void. But remember, our life comes from the spoken word of God, who is actively, presently speaking into our lives. May we listen well, and may we wander well with one another during this seminal time of change. I told you there was something else. Sermon's over, that part's done. But I do have, um, I guess it's sort of an announcement. I was sitting in my car uh, on Thursday across the street from Spokane's largest uh, downtown homeless shelter, and I was talking on the phone with Mark Finney, who uh, is the pastor of Emmaus Church in the Perry District, and he also happens to be the director of World Relief here in Spokane. I was asking Mark how their agency has been affected and how I might be able to relay to you all uh, what their needs are right now. And Mark gave me three things. He said, first, pray. Uh, so I'm hopeful that this week and beyond, we are able to be uh, the church who prays well for uh, our refugee community. He said, second, and this is a little specialized, 
If there are any of you out there who are technologically savvy enough or have done this before to over the phone help navigate uh, a world relief client through the process of filing for unemployment, your services would be very much appreciated. And you can go up to their website to try to figure out how to contact them to offer those services. Thank you for doing that. The third thing is money. Um, I'm not a very economically or even fiscally intelligent person. And so the economic impact that the pandemic has had on us has been a little confusing to me, but I think I kind of got it this week. Mark was saying that um, their contracts to resettle refugees in Spokane, uh, not only the ministry and the social service they provide, it's also how they pay the bills. He's not expecting that they are going to be able to do that for at least six months. That's a long time to go without your main source of income. And so World Relief and agencies like it are suffering. Mark told me that right before he and I had that phone call, he had had to lay off an employee that had worked there for eight years. Shanela told me, I hope Shanela is okay with, uh, with me sharing. Shanela uh, told me that her hours at Ann Ogden Hall have been cut by more than half. On Thursday this last week, right after I had that conversation with Mark, my department at Catholic Charities, which is about 40 people, got cut to about 17 people. I, I didn't understand that this was having the economic impact that it's been having, not just on for-profit businesses, not just restaurants and, and things like that, but also in the non-profit sector. It's having this massive reach of impacts. It's affecting everyone socially. It's had these massive health, uh, obvious uh, health um, impacts. And now we're beginning to see the rise of its economic effects. The world, when this is happening, I think is turning inward, wanting to be self-preserving, self-sustaining. I do not believe that is the call of the church. I do not believe we are called to turn inward and to self-preserve, to self-sustain. It might even be just for a time as this that we are called to instead be turned outward and focused on our community, on the people who need us the most. I will remind you, this church supports multiple missions partners through its charitable giving, and if we don't have the funds to be able to support them, I don't know what's gonna happen. This is my charge for you today. If you are in a financial position, to continue to give as normally as you would have. Please continue to do that. That's going to help this church support our community. It's going to help this church support itself. Thank you for doing that. And if there are some among you who are blessed to be in a situation in which you could actually give more than normal, I'm going to encourage you to think about giving to two particular agencies. The first is World Relief. They need it right now. And they have had such an impact on shaping the cultural landscape of Spokane for years now in supporting our refugee brothers and sisters. The second that I would encourage you to give to, if you can, is to support Big Table, which is a ministry here in town, started here in Spokane, uh, to help support uh, industry workers of the food and hospitality industries. Everybody is hurting who works in that environment. They have no health insurance, they have no contingency plan, no life insurance, health, yeah, anything. Uh, Big Table is an agency that's going to be able to help give just something, pay an energy bill, pay rent, fix a car for people who just are out of options right now. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'm gonna give the benediction. 
There are prayer requests in the back of the bulletin. Spend some time taking a look at those. Uh, there are also some questions for reflection and for discussion that have more to do with the sermon. Take a look at those if you want. Okay, now receive this benediction. May God bless you and keep you, dear people. May God shine light upon you and may God be gracious to you. May you experience the unifying presence of God within you always. May you have good health and may you have deep peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week.